Hello Interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. Today I'm going to be demonstrating the use of the RT809F Serial ISP Programmer. Um, so this is a serial programmer that is used for flashing, uh, well, all kinds of serial flash chips really. The main use that I'm going to be demonstrating today is for flashing uh, BIOS chips on motherboards and such like. You guys have seen me doing this in a couple of videos now, however this is a more formal demonstration of the product. So previously in other videos I have used this EZP2019 high speed programmer. This was the first one that I purchased and I successfully used this to recover a, um, uh, an, a Gigabyte Aorus B450M uh, that, was, um, that was BIOS bricked because that motherboard had all kinds of issues. Um, and uh, I successfully used this to recover that motherboard. And it's a very nifty device and it's very cheap. However, since using it on that, I've tried to recover various other motherboards and I've had mixed levels of success. Some I've won, some I haven't. But the problem is, is that when this guy doesn't work, you get no information at all. You get nothing. All you know is that you just, it doesn't work. It doesn't give you any useful feedback, any useful error messages at all. And therein lies the principal problem is that when you don't get a win with this, you don't know why. You don't know if it doesn't support the chip or if you made a mistake or if there's a problem with the connections or if that isn't the problem with the device at all. You just don't know. So um, what I wanted to do was to get a more advanced programmer and see if my success rate improved. And that's where the 809F came in. Um, this came recommended to me from a couple of people. Uh, there, are, there is another variation of this that's called the RT-809H. Um, and the, RT9, uh, the 809H is a much bigger boy. It's about sort of that big, I think, compared to this guy. Um, and it has a couple of extra advantages. It supports a great deal additional chips. Um, however, uh, it's, also re it's also reasonably more expensive. This guy is fairly modestly priced. Um, I will put the current price as I found on AliExpress on the, uh, or some other website on screen now, just so you guys can see the cost. And that's at the time of editing the video. So this guy's a bit more expensive than the EZP2019 was, um, but I'll demonstrate to you how it is better and why this has become my weapon of choice. Before we get started though, I'm going to switch over to the device that I'm going to be repairing today, uh, which is an X299 motherboard that looks like it has a busted BIOS. So let's switch over to that and get the BIOS chip off of that and then we can move on to reprogramming it. So here we have the system that I'm diagnosing at the moment. So uh, this is an X299 system. I put an AMD cooler on it because I'm hectic like that. Um, now, this system has a known good CPU, known good memory, uh, it's got my tester graphics card on it, and it's got a known good power supply on it. So to all intent and purpose, the only possible thing that can be broken about this setup is the motherboard. So let's turn it on and I'll show you what it's doing. So we've got power on at the power supply and as you can see the RGB is lit up. So we've got 5 VSB, that's 5 volt standby. Now let me show you what happens if I try and power it on. So you can see that we're power cycling very quickly. On each power cycle, the RGB resets. We get a quick flash of double zero from the postcode reader, which just doesn't mean anything because it's not getting far enough to do anything. And the cooler is flashing on and off. There's also an unpleasant ticking noise coming from the power supply as that cuts in and out. So let's turn that off. Now someone else has done all of the diagnostics on this already. Uh, and they believe that the BIOS on this is toast. Apparently it's a known issue with these things. So what we're going to do is we're going to get the BIOS chip off this board, reprogram it and see if that brings it good. So with that demonstration in mind, let's break all of this down and get down to the motherboard and I'll show you how we can find the BIOS chip and remove it. So the BIOS chip is most likely to be a SOP8 package, that's SOP8 package. Uh, now I've done videos where I've demonstrated doing this before, so uh, my regular viewers will probably know what we're looking for and what's coming next. Um, however, I'll show it all again just for those who, ha who haven't watched every one of my videos. Uh, on modern motherboards, you're likely to see a couple of variations. You do see some um, 
uh, WSON, uh, that's WSON uh, packages. Is that my adapter for it? It's not. I've got an adapter for WSON somewhere that shows the shape of the chip. Um, however, that's not what we're seeing on this board, so I'm not going to bother going into it now. But there's a few variations of the BIOS chip. On an ATX motherboard, it's probably going to be a um, it's probably going to be a SOP8. So that's what I'm looking for. On modern motherboards, you're going to find it somewhere in the bottom half. Um, on this board, it's tucked away here between these two PCIe slots, right between the battery as well, which is really heckin' awkward to get to. Let's go in a bit closer and show you that. So that's our chap down there. And I know that this is the BIOS chip because the branding on it is MXIC, which is a classic brand of SPI flash chips, which are very, very common for modern BIOS chips. The other giveaways are it's right next to the um, it's right next to the CMOS battery, which is not a sure thing, but again, it helps. And the other giveaway as well is next to it, we've got a jumper header. There's a pin header there, and that is actually a direct bus into the BIOS system. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. So let's take this um, uh, let's take this M2 shield off so we can actually get to that. So that guy there is an MXIC 25L12873F or 73P. 73F. So that's the chip that we're dealing with. Now, there are a couple of options for reprogramming this guy. Um, in order to reprogram it, uh, we could get some pin headers and jump onto this pin header here. Now, theoretically, this would be the easiest way to do it if you have the right cable. But the issue is, is that that pin header, I don't know if that is a standardized pin out. So what you would probably need is some kind of octopus cable where you actually look up, you either buzz out the pins or look it up and you tuck your pins onto the correct um, uh, wires onto the correct pins. Um, I haven't bothered trying to do this yet, just simply because I don't have the right kind of wire to do it. Uh, I should get one at some point to experiment with this, but that's not a job for today. The other possibility is to get what's known as a clip, uh, and a clip is a little clamp thing, like a little, well, yeah, it's just a little clamp that just clips onto the top of the chip, and the pins on it just clip onto the sides of the pins on both sides of the chip. Uh, again, very convenient. You clip it on there and you're straight onto the chip without having to desolder it. But there's two problems with this. Number one, it's really hard to find reliable clips. Um, I have The one that I have, I've tried it half a dozen times and had zero luck with it. And other people I know have also confirmed that they generally end up having to buy 10 clips to find one that's actually any good. Um, and the other issue is that look at the space we've got around this chip. There's no way you're getting a clip onto that. It's not going to fit in there. Um, so this isn't the case for all BIOS chips. Sometimes there's plenty of room around them and you can get a clip on there. However, in this instance, there's no way you're going to clip onto that. So I'm not even going to bother getting out the clip to show you. Um, now, there is a lot of debate as to whether um, flashing the chip in circuit is good or bad. Um, I have had people from both sides of the argument in my comments section. I've had people saying, clips are absolutely fine, I do it all the time. I've had other people saying that they also never have any luck with clips and they don't bother using them. And then I've also had some people who say, oh, I desolder and lift um, a couple of pins of the chip and tuck a bit of paper under there to isolate the chip. And I'm like, by the time you've gone to that much trouble, why the hell don't you just desolder the entire chip? So there's a lot of debate over this. I prefer to desolder the chip um, because I have the equipment to do that. It's not difficult when you have a hot air station and a pair of tweezers. So personally, I desolder the chip. You guys can do whatever you think works for you. In any case, we're going to desolder this. Now, we are going to have to do it very carefully because we're in very close proximity to this PCI Express slot and the um, battery holder. So we're going to have to be careful not to melt stuff. But anyway, here goes nothing. I'm going to remove the BIOS battery. OK, right, I'm going to turn on my hot air station run it to uh, maximum temperature, maximum air, and we're going to get that chip out of there. So we're going to go in and out as quick as we can without melting stuff off of the board. Here we go.
one and done. Mental note that pin one is going to the bottom right hand side of the motherboard because it's not actually marked on this motherboard. Usually pin one is marked, but it is not. Now before we slap this guy into the programmer, there's a bit of information that we must check first, and that is we need to check if this is a 3 volt chip or a 1.8 volt chip. The usual rule of thumb is that a SOP8 package like this is going to be 3 volts. However, I've seen plenty of these boys that are also 1.8 volts, so that is not a sure thing. The general, usually, if it's a SOP8 like this, it's probably 3 volts. If it's a WSON, is probably 1.8. However, like I said, there are variations, so you always check anyway. So the model number, as previously stated, is a 25L12873F. And if I smash that into Google, I can very quickly pull up the data sheet for it here. Uh, features, single power supply operation, 2.7 to 3.6 volts for read, erase, and program operations. So that's what we needed to know. If it was a 1.8 volt, as previously stated, the RTA29F does not support 1.8 volts uh, out of the box. You need an adapter. However, I'll show you the adapter setup for that in just a moment anyway, just so you know what that looks like. So the next thing we've got to do is get this guy into here. So to do that, we need a couple of different adapters. And I'll show you a selection of the ones that I've got available to me. Um, this particular programmer didn't come with any adapters. I'm just going to double check the box, actually. Oh, I lie, it did come with an adapter. That makes me feel very foolish because I bought some others. Oh, well. My one came with uh, this adapter board here. So as you can see, this one supports uh, SOP8. Uh, and we've also got the footprints on that for... We've got WSON in the middle there as well. Uh, and there's probably a half dozen others there if you can figure out the orientation of it. Um, so this is one way of doing it, and this will assemble into something that looks similar to this. As you can see, here's another pin adapter. Ah. And I've got here, we've got the footprints for the SOP8 package, which would go on like that. So we solder that on there, and then that translates over to uh, this pin adapter, which then drops into the reader like so, and bam. Now we've got the chip adapted for the, uh, for the programmer. Job done. Uh, some other options that we have as well are uh, if we have a 1.8 volt chip and we need to adapt down to 1.8, you'll need this 1.8 volt adapter. And this is a pretty simple device here. As you can see, we've got the, um, uh, we've got the eight pins on the bottom that will drop into the programmer like so, make sure that's actually in properly. And then it has a little regulator on it that drops three volts down to 1.8 volts. And then this, this guy here, that's going to basically just be a serial interface that just buffers everything back onto this guy. And now from here, you have an adapter socket at 1.8 volts, which you can then drop your other adapter into. And you'll end up with this wonderful Tetris stack building up here and now you can put a 1.8 volt chip in it. Then the other adapter that we can also use is this guy here, which you guys have seen in a video before. This I purchased with my EZP2019, and this is a SOP8 socket. So as you can see, it's got this big old spring-loaded affair, which you can drop a surface mount chip directly into with a little bit of fiddly fingers. There we go. Stick you, guy, stick you in there. And now that goes straight into pin pitch, which we can drop into the programmer. Bam, ready to go. So that saves us a soldering job. Um, however, the issue with this is that we might get connection problems on this, which you can mitigate just by fiddling with it to make sure it's settled properly. Uh, or also another top tip I heard from someone else who does this often is they have a little bit of sandpaper on hand and they just very gently just sand the bottom of the pins on the chip to make sure there's a good connection there instead of some horrible blobby solder. Uh, which again, top tip. I haven't implemented that yet, uh, but it's a thing you can do. Um, so this guy, this adapter, because we've just got spring-loaded pin connections onto the chip, this is an imperfect solution. Um, however, the great thing about the RTA29F is that, as I will hopefully be able to demonstrate, is that it can tell you when there's a bad connection to the chip. 
where the EZP2019, this guy will just say, couldn't read the chip. And at that point, you're like, is it, have I got the wrong chip selected? Is the chip faulty? Uh, is there a bad connection? Is the device faulty? Who knows? Whereas this will actually tell you that there is a bad connection. It will tell you what pin has a bad connection. So I'm really hoping that I can reproduce the fault with that. Otherwise, I have some other footage of it happening anyway. Let's crack on. So we've got our chip. We know that we don't need the, the 1.8 volt adapter. And I've now got it loaded in the programmer. I'm just going to make sure it's actually in the correct holes. For this particular programmer, we use the lower half of the adapter. This is as opposed to the EZP2019 where you use the upper part of the adapter. So pay attention to the pictures on here. As you can see from here, a SOP8 goes in the lower half, whereas on this one, the SOP8 goes in the top half first. So let's plug this in and I'll show you the software. I'm gonna open up a browser and I'm just gonna Google search for RT809F software. And the top here is for the ifix.net.cn website, which are the people who make this thing. So English version of the RT-809F software, that's what I want. And so we've got the RT-809F, not the H. So let's jump through to this forum thread. Then if I scroll down, we should have a download link. Here we go, RT-809F and H multi-language version. That's what I want. So incidentally, here's a picture of the RT-8209H programmer. So as you can see, it's a much bigger boy. Uh, fine, right, software version. I will have the latest one for the F. Download multi-language. Okay, here's where things start getting a little bit tricky. I'm gonna hit Google Translate in the top right. There we go. I will have an ordinary download, please. Thank you. And yeah, we, we go through a lot of weird places to get software here. Yes. Green tick. There we go. And it's downloading. Uh, so yes, uh, we've got the software downloading. So we'll open that up. And I'm going to run through the installation for this. Right. Um, let's launch the software. So we've come up with a garbled error message because I don't have Chinese Simplified installed. I'll click OK to that. And it's now installing the USB driver for this thing. Now the USB driver is installed, we can start up the software and we'll now see that the program is now detected. So as you can see, we've got programmer version V5 there. So it's detected the programmer, no error messages. So now we're ready to program. So. I'm going to start off by just taking the chip as it is and dropping that into the programmer and we'll see if we can get a read on this. So I'll drop that in and just a pro tip, rather than holding this down as hard as possible, I actually just let the pins float a couple of millimeters out and I found that tends to get a better connection on the, uh, the socket. So I've put that in and what I'm going to do, I'm just going to hit smart identify and we'll see what it can detect. So immediately, we've come up with a chip, and it's close. It's an MX25L128. However, the end section of it isn't right. So the smart identify is a bit hit and miss. The chances are, if we go ahead and do a read on that, we'll probably get a successful read. However, I'm going to see if we can actually get the absolute correct one. So if I scroll down a little bit further here... We've actually got the right one there, MX25L12835F SOP8. So we have got the correct one on the list, so let's bang that in. So current chip selected, there we go. As mentioned, the other one probably would have worked. However, if you can find an exact match on the list, then that's a lot better. So let's go ahead and read that now. So that's starting to read the chip. Now, if you get a successful read and dump of the contents of the chip, the chances are your chip selection is good enough that it will work. So if you're going on a non-precise selection, then try reading from the chip and try your luck. Uh, generally speaking, reading from the chip is free. Thus far, I've had no issues just taking pot shot reads. 
So it's successfully read the chip. Now it's going to verify and just make sure it gets the same thing back twice. And those of you who remember when I was messing around with the EZP 2019 will recall that so far this is much faster than the 2019. OK, we've successfully read the chip. So I'm going to save this uh, ROM dump. So I've got a folder that I've just called ROM dumps. And this is just where I dump any, any chip dumps that I've acquired. So anything that I've got, I just dump them all in here just so I can make backups and refer back to them and stuff like that. So uh, what was this motherboard? It was a X299XE. So I'm going to call that X299XE bad dot bin. Cool. And we can also open up the buffer buffer. And that shows us what we actually pulled out of the chip. So we've got a load of data in here. However, this will be encrypted. So if you're looking at that going, that doesn't make any sense to anyone. Uh, it's because it's encrypted. Um, I don't know if it's possible to actually start decrypting and messing around with BIOSes to modify them. I haven't learned that much about this yet. Um, there is some method in that. There's some mad lads out there that get into all of this. I just haven't investigated it. But I've had a couple of people who've said to me in the comments section or via DMs, they've said, oh, yeah, there are communities that actually dig into these files and reverse engineer them and so on. Um, but we're just interested in repair from for this video. So we've got a read from that file. So just for the sake of demonstration now, I'm going to try and get a bad read on it just to see if we can demonstrate the uh, RT-809F's ability to, de to show bad connections. All right, I've just tweaked the chip so it's a bit crooked. And let's just see if it can still read it. There we go. Perfect. So as you can see, now the chip is crooked in the SOP8 adapter. It's actually told us, please check when the chip is good and pins are inserting correctly properly. So you can see here, it's actually specified that pin 2 has poor contact. So it's told us exactly which pin it has a problem with. So let's try settling that in the reader again. So I'll just drop that in place. And I've just ruffled that. I haven't put it in any particular way. And let's try a retry. There we go. And now we're reading the chip again. So this is really important because if you'd done that in the EZP 2019, it just would have said a read error or something like that. Whereas with this one, it told us exactly what the problem was, so we knew exactly what to do to resolve it. Um, now, I have other examples where I was trying to do a read and I could not get the chip to settle correctly. And if I, held, if I had put my finger on the chip and pressed it down into the reader, that fixed the problem. We'll just cancel this because we've already got this file. Um, however, it proved that this thing is not infallible. And as I mentioned earlier on, if you got a little bit of sandpaper and just sanded the bottom of the pins just to get a nice clean surface, that would probably resolve that issue. Your other alternative is to solder onto one of these adapters. And that is often what I do um, because, again, it doesn't take more than a couple of seconds just to solder onto this adapter and then you know that that boy is connected. So have an experiment, see what works for you. If you're getting into this scene, I recommend trying to have a selection of adapters on hand. Have a couple of these. You've got the one that comes with it as well. Um, try and get yourself one of these because they're really nifty when they work. And obviously get yourself a 1.8 volt adapter. And all of these things are really, really cheap. The only annoying part of it is just the fact that most of them you have to order from China. And that obviously means you're going to be looking at three to four weeks delivery, depending on where you are in the world. But if you don't mind waiting, the adapters and things, they're not expensive. So just pick up a selection of different adapters so you've got an arsenal in the box to work with when you're trying to get the chip to work in the reader. Now we've successfully dumped the ROM file off of this chip, we want to program it with the correct one. So I'm going to go to the Asus website and we're going to get the right BIOS for this. So let's switch back to a browser and let's go Asus X299. XE Gaming, there we go, ROG Strix, uh, support, which is behind my face, file some firmware. I'm just going to hit download on the latest version, and if we open up that zip file, 
now we've got our BIOS file to program. So this has come in as a CAP file, but you might also see them with either CAP or um, DAT. Uh, DAT files are often an update rather than the entire binary, depends on what you've got. And in addition to that, um, it's also quite common to see BIOS files where the file extension is the BIOS version that you're updating to. So, uh, for example, um, Asus tend to use these CAP files, but on Gigabyte, it might be um, you might download a uh, model number .p2.5 or something like that. So yeah. Anyway, what I'm going to do, I'm going to copy that into ROM dumps. So now I'm going to hit open. And we're going to select Rogstrix X299 XE Gaming. Open. File has been loaded. And we will now go ahead and write it. So when you hit write, this will do the full auto everything. So it's automatically going to erase the chip. And by the looks of things, it erases it a couple of times just to be certain. Or it's doing it in blocks. I'm not sure. At any rate, it's going to erase the chip write the firmware, then it's going to verify it to make sure that the write was successful. Now the erase is done and we're writing. And once again, I've said this before already, but for anyone who's seen me using the EZP2019 or who has an EZP2019 or the 2020, you'll notice how much faster this thing is than the EZP. Um, like, yeah, the erase one was kind of weird there because it did it several times, but the read and write process, so much faster. It's night and day different. Normally, I would walk away and leave it to run, but now you can actually sit around for it. Now we're verifying. And now we are done. So that's it. All, succeed, all success, no error messages have appeared. So now we're ready to go. So I can now take this guy out and we'll get this guy soldered back onto the motherboard and see if we win. Yeah, that'll do. My AMD cooler is going on a little bit of a pirouetting wonder, but that's fine. Doesn't need to cool the CPU, it's just got to stop it from blowing up. Okay, um, power on. Standby and power. It's running, boys. Let's get some HDMI on that. Postcodes are going through a wonder. I didn't have the HDMI plugged in right away, so I might have to power cycle that to get a signal out of it. Nope, there we go, we have post. There you go, everyone. And that is how you use an RT809F serial ISP programmer to save a motherboard. So we've demonstrated this thing reflashing chips in the socket, but the keen-eyed among you may have also noticed that for some reason or other, we got VGA ports on this thing and a HDMI port on the side. And you might be asking yourself, well, what the hell is that for? Uh, and the short answer is, is that you can actually talk to monitor uh, to monitors and flash their firmware and BIOSes over the display cables. Uh, I'll demonstrate that for you now. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this because I don't have a lot of expertise. Like, for example, we've got two ports. We've got a VGA and an ISP port. I'm not sure what this what ISP actually is. Um, so, uh, however, the idea is, is that if, you, if this is something that you do know about and you are interested in, you probably can get enough out of this to determine if this is right for you. But let me show you anyway. So I've got here, I've got a Philips HD monitor, HDMI cable. And as you can see, it's going to go into no signal detected. There we go. Check cable connection. So let's plug that into the side of the programmer. So we're literally just going to plug that into the HDMI port. And let's do smart ID again. Now, at this option, it says click OK to check the chip or cancel to enter ISP smart identify. So let's select cancel. And it has identified 
external SPI ISP. So now I'm not sure what chip is in there, but let's go ahead and try and do a read and see what happens. Now there's something interesting that will happen here. Keep an eye on this check cable connection that's going on in the background here. Now watch as I hit read. Notice how the display has stopped moving while we're reading the chip. And over SPI, it's found an MX25L4005 SOIC8. So it's found what sounds like a bog standard uh, spy flash chip in the monitor that it's talking to over HDMI. This is super rad. I didn't know you could do this and it probably would have made that 4K monitor an awful lot easier, but there it is. So we'll let this do the read, auto verify. And as you can see, the monitor in the background has just rebooted because we've disconnected from the, uh, from the chip inside it. And the, uh, the software is now offering me to save the dump file, just like we did with the ordinary chip that we stuck in the socket. So at this point now, I could save this bin file and I could flash another bin file up to that monitor. Now, I don't have another firmware file and also I don't really want to mess around with this monitor because this one will be a pain in the ass to take apart. So I'm not gonna demonstrate any further with this, but by virtue of the fact that we have successfully interfaced with the monitor and read the firmware off of it, that demonstrates exactly what the uh, um, external monitor connections on the RT809F can actually do. So that is just a quick proof of concept for why this thing has monitor connections on the side. So past that, that's about everything that I'm gonna show you about this particular programmer. However, I hope you guys found that kind of interesting. Um, this so far has been a very worthwhile investment for me. Like I said at the start of the video, the EZP 2019, I was having a little bit of hit and miss luck with this thing. Um, and whereas with the RT809F, this takes the doubt out of the situation. So if you're looking to get into BIOS flashing, um, I mean, these things are so cheap that it's probably worth buying one anyway and just having two because having two, diff two of the same tools is never a bad thing. Just like with screwdrivers, I always recommend having two different screwdrivers that are the same size, like just two 00 Phillips, because you'll find that they're slightly different and different ones work in different situations. Uh, most of the time, I'm, almost prob I'm probably never gonna use the EZP2019 these days, but the fact is, is that I've got two alternatives. And also if I'm doing something really dumb and I don't wanna risk blowing up my nice, my nice programmer, I can use my crappy cheap one. So just a thought. In any case, this is definitely a product that I'd recommend using. As someone who, is, who has been getting into BIOS programming and has been having a lot of success with it, as you saw in this video, this, this guy has been a really worthwhile investment. The monitor connections, honestly, I don't know how useful those are in the real world. Um, because flashing, flashing firmware on a monitor, I'm honestly not really sure how useful that is, except for very odd circumstances like that Dell monitor video that I did. However, as just a chip socket programmer, this guy is really good. The software is excellent as well. Uh, I wish they had something that was a little bit less janky for the download and installation. Um, because it's a, you know you need to do a little bit of um, you do, need to do a little bit of sleuthing to actually get that software going, but in any case once you've got it working it's a great bit of kit. Past that that's everything I've got for you today. So thank you very much for watching everyone. As always the support links for my Discord, my Patreon, and my Twitter are in the description down below. Stick around for the end card, and I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you very much. Bye for now.